Welcome to the Grace Community Church Sermon Webcast. Grace is a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America, located in Yulee, Florida, and devoted to faithfully proclaiming the scriptures. For more information about Grace or how to contact us, visit us online at gracenassau.com. And now, give your attention to the preaching of God's Word. I'm going to invite you to turn down your copy of the scriptures to Philippians chapter 2 as we've been kind of going through the Christ hymn, the hymn to Christ uh, there that Paul uh, includes there in chapter 2. You might recall that uh, he is encouraging the Philippians to uh, follow the pattern that Christ has laid out, the pattern of humility, the pattern of making himself nothing, the pattern of putting himself last and others first, uh, setting aside his rights and his, his glory uh, in order that he might uh, bring salvation to all who would trust in him, to his people. And so we're going to re- read that passage again this morning. Uh, our focus, of course, will be on the death of Christ, where it says that he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. We'll be reading chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 of Philippians. So let's ask for his blessing now upon the reading and preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, your word is truth. And Lord, all of your righteous truths and words endure forever, Lord. For the word of God endures. Though, Lord, we are like the grass of the field, we wither. But Father, your eternal word... May it be proclaimed today. May your word, Lord, go deep into our hearts and may it bear fruit and grow up, Lord, and spring up, Lord, to bring about great fruit for your glory. And may it encourage us, may it strengthen us, strengthening our faith and our resolve to live as the followers of Jesus Christ. It's in his name now we ask all of this. Amen. So if there's any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accordance and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count your others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks be to God for his word. You may be seated. So according to public opinion, at least the public opinion of many people these days, all religions are basically the same. All religions basically teach the same basic truths. The names and the places and the semantics may differ, but they all teach that divine acceptance, whatever that means and whatever that looks like, comes by good works, by you being a good person, by you trying really hard. Now, there is some truth to that, right? Even for Christianity, except this, that the works that save the Christian are not his. The works that save the Christian are the works of another. The works of Christ is what saves the Christian. It's not his works. It's not the Christian's works that save him, but it's the work of Christ that saves the Christian. Christ Jesus, who is God, who existed from all eternity in the form of God, but did not grasp at his right as God, right? He let all that go. This is what we've looked at over the last few weeks. He let that go. He did not grasp 
at his rights, the things that were rightfully his, the glory that was his. But he humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, by taking on our nature, our limitations, and our weakness. Now, what we call this is the humiliation of Christ. Now, usually when we use the word humiliation, we're talking about being embarrassed, right? You humiliated me in front of the, that person. Um, or, you know, when you read the wrong call to worship, you feel humiliated, right? Uh, that sort of thing. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, uh, not about embarrassment, right? Uh, and usually whenever we talk about that kind of humiliation, what, ha- what, it, what, what has happened? Well, usually it means that someone put us in our place. We were humiliated. Someone put us in our place. Well, when we talk about Christ's humiliation, it's a little different, right? He was not put in his place in his humility. He was put in our place in his humility. He, and he put himself there. He did this voluntarily, willingly put himself in our place. And that is really the key difference, I think, between Christianity and every other religion. Every other religion is that our God put himself in our place. A church historian named Bruce Shelley put it like this. Christianity is the only major religion to have as its central event the humiliation of its God. So what's the difference between all religions? There you have it. That's, that's one. We can draw, of course, many other comparisons there and, other, and, and, and highlight other differences, but this is one of the most Uh, ones that stand out, at least for us today, as we think about the humiliation of Christ. Now, the Westminster Larger Catechism, uh, the catechism of our church, it it, it puts it like this, that Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death, for a time. Now, for the last three weeks, that's what we've been looking at, is the humiliation of Christ. Okay, Him coming, being born in a low condition, under the law, and, and enduring and undergoing all of the various miseries that we face. You know, I was, uh, when I was uh, with June this week, uh, you know, we were talking about Christ understanding our misery, about Christ uh, being sympathetic, a sympathetic high priest in our misery in our lowliness, and in the pain and the suffering that we endure. And one of the things I drew out was, uh, as, as I mentioned to her, was even though it, his situations were not all identical to ours, right, but he does understand human suffering. Even when it comes to losing a loved one. Because we don't, we don't really know what happened to his earthly father, Joseph, but it's pretty clear he disappears from the story. And that it's likely that Joseph at some point died before Jesus began his earthly ministry. And, you know, what strikes me so much about that is that here we have the Son of God who has uh, the power to raise the dead, and he doesn't even raise his own earthly father from the dead. He doesn't heal his earthly father, but lets him die. He allows it to happen because that was the will of God. He didn't use his divine power to sort of intervene in that painful situation. Certainly seeing his own mother weep and grieve the loss of her husband. And he could have intervened. He could have uh, saved her from that and saved himself from that and delivered uh, his entire family from that pain. And he didn't do it. He underwent the miseries of this life, including the death of loved ones. And then his own death, of course, the cursed death of the cross. And so he, he... he he endured all of these things. So he understands our predicament. He understands the turmoil we go through. He, he was there. He walked in our shoes. He didn't somehow mitigate the sufferings and agonies of this life by his divine power. So as I said last week, you know, his hunger, his thirst, these were really experienced by our God in his flesh. He allowed himself to undergo all of these things. And um, so... This is all part of his humiliation, but we now we continue then looking at his own death on the cross. We'll consider his death from two angles. The fact of his death and the effect of his death. And so the fact of his death, what I mean here is the biblical and historical fact of his death, but also the theological fact of his death, the necessity of his death. 
Now, when it was announced in Britain a few years a, month, a few months ago, you know that the Queen is dead. Um, you know, it's kind of the, the tradition, right? They have some official come out and stand on the balcony and announce it all throughout uh, England, all throughout the United Kingdom. The Queen is dead. No one shouted back. Exactly how dead is she? Is she mostly dead? Princess Bride fans will get that reference there, right? How dead is she exactly? No, no one said that. No one asked because they know what it means when someone's dead. Okay, and you know, and same with Jesus. He was dead. Okay, he stopped breathing. His heart stopped beating. Brain activity ceased. Now, why do I bring this up? Why do I mention this? Well, I, I think I mentioned last week that many of the creeds, you know, were written to counter the heresies concerning Christ that were out there floating around for many centuries. And so the the church would uh, get to a point where they'd say, you know, we need to come together and we need to. We need to, you know, nail these truths down. We need to get them down, written down clearly so that uh, we can be really precise about what we believe concerning Christ so that it's really clear who, who is outside of the faith and who's in it. And they have all kinds of theories about Christ, all kinds of theories about his natures, his two natures, or whether he even had two natures. Uh, were his natures blended? Were they sort of like scrambled eggs mixed in together? What, what was his nature like? And so... Of course, one of those is that one of the, those uh, false teachings was that he only appeared to be a man. That his body just looked human, but it was really just an illusion. It was just just a, a, a you know a, an appearance. That it wasn't actually the substance of human nature. Okay, and that that view that 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 school of thought was called Docetism, right? coming from the Greek word to appear or seem. But here's the problem. If his human nature was just an illusion, then so was his death. Okay? And, and that blood he shed, that wasn't blood. It just looked like blood. So he didn't really die. He didn't really shed his blood. And we're told in Scripture plainly, point blank, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so if Jesus didn't really shed his blood, then there's no forgiveness of sins. And we're not forgiven. Uh, The new covenant in Christ's blood, right, as as Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper there, on the night that he's betrayed, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of sins. He was was giving them uh, this, uh, this, the Lord's Supper, as a reminder of that covenant that he has established. Well, guess what? That covenant, null and void. It doesn't apply because that wasn't blood. But yet Hebrews 10 says this, we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus by a new and living way he has opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh. But if he didn't have a real, true, genuine human nature, or human body, if his body and blood and death were all an elaborate illusion, illusion, so is this confidence he speaks of. Guess what? We don't have confidence to enter the holy places. No confidence. The sanctuary doors remain shut and locked, and none of us can enter in. And on top of that, we remain lost and in our sins. And under the wrath of God, if Jesus did not have a true body, if Jesus did not truly die and shed his blood. Athanasius of Alexandria, he was one of the, he was present at the Council of Nicaea. So that was a long time ago, right? Back when the years still had three digits. And he said this in his, uh, on the incarnation, he says, assuming a body like ours, because all people were liable to the corruption of death, Christ takes on a body capable of death. This is a major part of why he took on a body, was to die, was so that he could die, so that he could be crucified, so that he could go and make this payment in the flesh. So, Jesus 
truly did die. His body did perish. But, of course, there's, there, that's not the only law of view that's out there, right? There have been some as well who, who were willing to accept the genuine human nature of Christ to say, okay, it was a real body. Yes, he really did suffer, even though unless Islam, Islam actually denies the suffering of Christ. They'll say that he really had a body, but they'll say that he didn't actually go to the cross and that he didn't really suffer. But some would say that they're willing to accept that Christ had a true, genuine human nature, but because their minds are so captivated by unbelief, they can't accept the resurrection. And so they would say, well, he didn't actually die. He swooned. You see, he was just unconscious. He, you know, his body went through a lot of turmoil, for sure, being nailed to the cross, but he didn't actually die. Because obviously people don't, don't raise from the dead today, and we're modern people. Right? We're so much smarter than people from the ages past. I'm being facetious here, right? Obviously. Okay, the, as C.S. Lewis called that chronological snobbery, right? You know, this idea that modern people are so much smarter and wiser than the people of the past. They were so superstitious. They were so dumb. Of course they believed that someone rose from the dead. Well, not according to the gospel records. Nobody went to the tomb expecting to find Jesus standing there, risen. They went to the tomb looking for a corpse. But anyways, I digress. That but, they, but some people reasoned that he swooned, that he was unconscious, and that so when he came out, he woke up in the tomb, somehow managed to roll a stone away after just waking up from being unconscious for three days, after losing all that blood. Yeah, okay, sure. And, um, and then the disciples just thought he rose from the dead. Now, I don't want to get too far into this, because next week we're going to be looking at his resurrection. So I'll just say this. Parents, forgive me if this is a bad word in your house. That's a stupid argument. It just is. Sometimes it's appropriate to use that word. And this is one of those times. Because think about it. The Roman soldiers oversaw the, the, the crucifixion and execution of countless people. They know what it looks like when a person is dead. They, they know how to identify uh, 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 that someone has, in fact, expired. They, they know what that looks like, okay? They were pretty smart, okay? They, 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 they could identify this, and they confirmed that Jesus was dead. But beyond these facts, it was necessary that Christ not only suffer and shed his blood, but that he also die. It was necessary, right? Because the wages of sin is not merely bleeding. The wages of sin is death. He had to suffer for our sins. He had to die. Okay, the Old Testament, Testament sacrifices, which foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ, okay, those animals didn't just simply bleed. They were slaughtered. They were killed on the altar. Their blood was spilled out, and they were slaughtered. They were killed. Christ was slaughtered. He was killed. He died. He was the final sacrifice, the last and final and ultimate sacrifice offered up for the sins of his people. And he gave up his life up unto death voluntarily, and he did so for a reason. There was a reason, certainly for the forgiveness of sins, but also as a ransom, as he himself said in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So if Jesus did not die, the ransom remains unpaid. The ransom debt is still due. And yet the scriptures plainly tell us Jesus died and that it was all necessary that he really and truly die. So that's the facts of his death. Let's talk about the effects of his death. And of course, we can't talk about every effect of his death. But we're going to look at a few of these. I've already mentioned, though, uh, the fact and necessity of him shedding his blood and, and uh, to pay for sin. So some of the things I've already said do apply here, right? If he did die, if it is a fact that he died, which it is, then that does mean we've been forgiven. That does mean the ransom's been paid. So all those things that would not be true are true because he gave his life, because he really did die. Okay, and if he shed his blood and died, and he is who he says he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, then we do have confidence to come before God in his presence, in his sanctuary, and know that we will not be turned away. 
Know that we will be received and we will be welcomed into his presence because Christ has made a way. He has opened us, opened the way for us to have access to him. It means then also that Jesus' mission was not a failure. It means that he accomplished his, his purpose for coming. In Luke 19.10, Jesus said, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, this is where I want to get into some of the effects uh, to really drill down deeply on this whole uh, fact of, of th- that he came to actually save. That, he, that his, the effect of his death and resurrection is that he really saved his people. Okay, not, not potentially saved them, but he actually saved them. Okay, and note it, it right there in Luke 19.10, it doesn't say that he came to seek and try to save the lost. He actually saved them. Done deal. Okay, it is finished, he said, just before he gave up his spirit. Now, why do I emphasize this? I think this is so important for us to really grasp the power of the cross to really p- grasp the power of his atoning work and of his shed blood. J.I. Packer writes this. He says, Our minds had been conditioned to think of the cross as a redemption which, which does less than save, I'm sorry, less than redeem, of Christ as a Savior who does less than save, and of God's love as a weak affection which cannot keep anyone from hell without help, and faith as the human help which God needs for this purpose. Is this striking a nerve, maybe, if when you hear like gospel presentations and you hear people talk about the cross and you hear, about, t- hear people talk about how one can be saved? So often, this is what they present is this sort of scenario here. Because our minds have been conditioned to think that somehow we've got to add our work of faith to the work of Christ in order for it to be effective, in order to be saved. But no, what Packer's pointing out here is this, that Christ's death had this effect. It actually saved his people. It actually atoned for their sins. His death actually accomplished redemption. But to say it is only that his, his work only made salvation possible is to also say that it was possible that none would be saved and that Christ possibly could have gone to the cross in vain. And died for nothing. What if no one believed? What if no one had faith? Then the Son of God went through the, these all this through his humility. He was humiliated for no reason whatsoever in the end. Because none would believe. But as it did, he came to save and he did not fail to save. Brothers and sisters, this is meant to give us confidence and assurance that he did not fail to save you and that your failure cannot undo what he has done. As Spurgeon put it like this, Charles Spurgeon said this so well, Christ so died that he infallibly secured the salvation of a multitude that no man can number, who through Christ's death not only may be saved, but are saved, must be saved, and cannot by any possibility run the hazard of being anything but saved. Praise God. This is good news for the Christian. You mean if I completely blow it tomorrow, then that doesn't mean I lost my salvation? No, it, you, you did not. Now, it might be, it, there, there's a possibility. Some people who think they're saved, they thought that they made things right with the Lord, but they didn't, and they don't really have faith. And so that's a conversation that needs to be had. Maybe they never had it. But if we are in Christ, nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing. Not even you. Not even your sin can snatch you out of his hand. But what does Jesus save us from? Right? We we, kind of know this already. But we're going to maybe go a little deeper, okay? Sin, of course, right? This is what the the angel said in Matthew 1. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the one who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus, of course, means Yahweh saves. The Lord saves. He is the Lord's salvation. He's come to save his people from their sins. Not potentially save his people from their sins. Not to just 
make it possible for them to be saved if they add certain things to it, their, their own willingness and their own faith and that sort of thing. Because the truth is, is faith is something he gives us. Faith is worked in us by him. And so if your faith is in Christ, he's done that. He's put that in your heart. And that's why you've received him by faith. It's because he did the work in you first. But sin, what is sin, right? Uh, it is not being or doing what God requires and doing what God forbids. This is the children's catechism. This is how it explains sin. Or as the shorter puts it to shorter catechism, it's any want of conformity to God's law or transgression of God's law. It's our failing to be conformed to his word and, and transgressing his word. And when we sin, you see, that's what we're doing. We're transgressing his law. We're transgressing his, his truths. And when we tra transgress his law, it's a cosmic crime. It's a crime, like any crime, that has penalties or wages. Wages of sin. Sin has separated us from God. It's caused hostility. It's put us in debt to God. We owe God a debt we cannot pay. It's put us on bad terms with our Creator. But the death of Christ has made it right. The death of Christ has brought us back together, has reconciled us to God. As Paul explains in Romans 5, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. While we were enemies. Pay attention to those words there. We were enemies. Right? We, we didn't have to try to become friends first before we could be saved. We were his enemies, and he went, he went to the cross and died for his enemies. For people who hated him, for people who rebelled against him, who spat in his face. He went to the cross for his enemies. He died for his enemies. And while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That relationship's been healed in the person of Christ and the work of Christ. We now have peace with God. The war is over. It's been ended. And he's brought us near to himself. Not only has he simply forgiven our sins and reconciled us to himself so that we're no longer enemies, but we've been given the family name. And we've been brought in for supper to be seated at his table. We're his children. We've been adopted. These are all the effects of his work. And we could go on to explore all the abundant riches of Christ's work of salvation. There's so much more that could be said. But all of the work of Christ, all of, everything, all of these abundant riches, Christ's work of salvation uh, secured them. His death secured these benefits. But ultimately, the last one I want to focus on is this, is his wrath, judgment. Christ's death satisfied God's justice and wrath. Because we had, obviously we had broken his law. Obviously we had uh, a debt we could not pay. We, there are penalties for breaking the law. And we owed that to God, but we can't pay it. And he paid it. He satisfied his, God's justice. He absorbed God's wrath. See, when he was on the cross, it wasn't just that he physically suffered, but he suffered in his soul as well. He endured the wrath of God. The, the, the cross itself uh, was but a glimpse of what was really going on behind the scenes spiritually. As Jesus was crushed by the Father, as he poured out his white hat of wrath upon his own son, he suffered the full justice and wrath of God for his people. And then the Paul goes on in 1 Thessalonians 5 to say, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And so all the charges, brothers and sisters, that stood against us, gone. Wiped out. Erased. The records there are, are, are cleansed. They're wiped out. He, he's, he's completely wiped them out by his own death. All the guilt of our transgressions was nailed to the cross. We bear it no more. Christ was obedient to death on a cross to bear us in a way. 
His death did not make salvation possible. It accomplished salvation. It accomplished it forever. And it did so without any human assistance. In fact, adding human assistance undermines the very message of the cross. His resurrection on the third day, of course, is proof that he did accomplish this work. His resurrection is proof that he made full satisfaction, that he atoned for our sins. But none of it would have been possible. I should say but and. None of it would have been possible if he was not both God and man. God and man in the two distinct natures, but in one person forever. To quote Athanasius one more time, I just really liked his reasoning and logic here. He says, nobody can make this satisfaction except God. And nobody ought to make it except human beings themselves. If then it is necessary that the kingdom should be fulfilled by the admission of humanity, and if we cannot be admitted unless this satisfaction for sin is made, it is necessary that someone must make satisfaction who is both God and man, both God and human being. Christ took on our flesh, our nature, so that he might make full satisfaction for all of our sins by his own death on the cross. You see, and this is why the angels who announced his birth said they had good news of great joy. It's good news for all peoples that there is a way to get right with God. There is a way to end the hostility. There is a way that you can enjoy the grace and blessings of God. And Maybe someone here this morning needs that. And if that's you, please hear me. There is a way to be forgiven of everything, of all that you've done wrong. Everything, and, er and even things you haven't done yet. That forgiveness doesn't just, you know, end with the past, right? It continues on in the present and in the future. But there's a way to be forgiven, to be reconciled to God, to have your sins completely wiped away. All your wrongdoings, done, gone. You bear those sins no more. You bear the guilt no more. And how is this? By acknowledging that you are a sinner. Acknowledging that you justly deserve his wrath and condemnation. And then repent. Repent of your unbelief. Repent of your efforts to try to be a good person to earn it. I was speaking to someone from Set Free the other day, and, and he, I think he believes, but he's so confused about that one issue. He keeps thinking that somehow he's got to earn Christ's sacrifice, that he's got to be so good and so righteous and so obedient in order to somehow, uh, you know, measure up to what Christ has done for him. And I said, you're trying to save yourself. You're trying to justify yourself by your works. And that's something we need to repent of. We need to repent of our damnable good works, right? Trust what Christ has done on the cross. Trust in his sacrifice. Trust that he died for your sins. Trust him entirely for all of your sins, for your entire predicament. I can't think of a better Christmas present to receive than the free gift of salvation in Christ. And even if you belong... Christ already. Let this be a reminder to you that he has done it all. It's so easy even as Christians to sort of fall back into that mindset of I've got to do this, that, and the other in order to be pleasing to God, right? In order to, uh, you know, he gave me an A, now I've got to keep the A, right? I've got to maintain my A all on my own. He is your Savior, past and present and future, will always be your Savior, even until the end of the age. You still contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. That's all we contribute, friends, is the sin that made his sacrifice on the cross necessary. And so I urge you then, let these truths humble your heart, but also fill you with joy as you remember what Jesus has done for you. And this is what we celebrate during this season, isn't it? All that Jesus has done for us and all that he's promised to do when he comes again in glory. Amen.